Good, good afternoon, uh, members and friends of Shemo and the uh, family of uh, Bill O'Neill, who number a lot. <laughs> and we're very happy to have them. Uh, Bill O'Neill is a lawyer, but I would venture to say that his practice is unlike that of any other lawyers in the room. It is global, it is dangerous, it is noble, and it is extremely challenging. Many of the lawyers among you might find that one of those ad adjectives fits your practice, but few have walked and worked in these places where angels fear to tread, as Bill has. We're honored to have him with us today to give us some insights into the challenges of modern peacekeeping from Haiti to Congo, and to help us to understand the complexities of our global interdependent world and the overwhelming abundance of human rights issues within it. Is the situation better or worse than in earlier times? Perhaps Bill can tell us. Bill O'Neill is a lawyer specializing in humanitarian, human rights, and refugee law. His work on judicial, police, and prison reform in Burundi, Liberia, Sierra Leone, South Sudan, Nepal, and Bosnia-Herzegovina. He has invested mass killings in Afghanistan for the high commander of human rights and conducted an assessment of the human rights situation in Darfur and trained the UN human rights monitor station there. Recently in a homily in Lampedusa, Pope Francis spoke about the globalization of indifference. He claims that we have access to the suffering of others and it doesn't concern us. It's none of our business. Our speaker today is not part of that culture of indif indif indifference, and I trust that his adamant rejection of indifference will help us to sharpen the edge of our own empathy and our own desire to make the world a better place. Please join me in welcoming Bill O'Neill. Thank you very much, Sandra, and also to the university for inviting me here today. It's great to be back. I was born in Scranton, and as Sandra said, uh, a, lot of, a lot of this room is filled with relatives. Um, a few I'd like to recognize briefly. One is my Aunt Lois Kelly, who served her home borough of Dunmore in many ways for many years, and my aunt and uncle, Tom, Dolores and Tom Gronke who uh, established a scholarship along with your late brother, Stanley Gronke, in honor of their late brother, Edward Gronke, who was a graduate of this university. And it's a scholarship to help a student who needs some financial support to attend the University of Scranton. And I think I can speak, I will speak for my cousins and now some of their offspring in saying that it was from you that we learned the meaning of service, of giving back, of community from your words and your deeds over all those years. So I just want to thank you and also your siblings, both the ones still here and the ones who have gone on. So uh, today, as Sandra said, I'm going to be talking about peacekeeping and its challenges, successes, failures, some of the situations that you're probably reading about in the world today or you might be reading about shortly because they're on the verge of becoming disasters and what in particular the UN is trying to do about it, the United Nations, which has been my main interlocutor, so to speak, in my experience working in these places. So I, I'm going to also show some slides. I promise not to do death by PowerPoint. That's uh, something I'm sure those in the corporate world are, have heard before, and in, and in the military world, too. Um, but I just thought I'd start off with a picture, and I'll throw it out to you uh, folks to see if you can identify where this is and when it happened, the events being portrayed in this slide. I know it's a little bit bright, even on this dark day, but anybody? Haiti? Haiti? Right on Haiti, now when? After the earthquake, now? Okay, now I get to be the mean teacher with the trick question. It's actually before the earthquake, it is Haiti. It's five years ago, just about to the day, November 2008, so 14 months before the earthquake. What was this? It was a school. That rubble you see there with the broken concrete and the little iron rod sticking out, that was a school in French with the cruelly ironic name of La Promesse, the promise. 
private school. In Haiti, on today, let's say today in Haiti, half the kids are going to school that should be. Half are not. Of the half who are going to school, 80% of them are in a private school. You say, fine, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that in Haiti? And I'm using Haiti now, uh, I could talk about mint, you could put in the word exchange, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Congo, many other countries. I'm using Haiti to illustrate it. Private schools totally unregulated. No oversight, no inspection. The school was built, I don't know if anyone's been to Port-au-Prince, it's very hilly, right? IET is the, the Arawak word for mountains. Haiti's very mountainous, even Port-au-Prince. So this school was built on a very steep incline, where a school never should have been built in the first place. Terrible construction. If Stanley Gronke were here, I'm sure he could analyze this and show he was a builder, he would show just how lousy the construction is. Watered down cement, poorly reinforced on a steep incline. Nobody from the Department of Public Works, Department of Education, Department of Transportation ever visited or inspected this school or any other. It was a business enterprise for the guy who owned the school. His goal was to maximize his profit. And those of you in business know you maximize your profit by keeping your costs down and your income high. So he was looking to build this school as cheaply as possible and then cram in as many kids as he could. They pay. Haitians parents are desperate to get their kids educations. They call these schools a cold bolet. Again, that's in Creole that means the lottery schools. It's almost like buying a lottery ticket. Most people realize your odds of getting an education are not that great, just as they aren't in the lottery, but you have some chance. If you're not going to school, there's no chance at all. So they will send their kids to these schools because the state has failed to build adequate state schools, which are also not very good, and the private sector has leaped in to take advantage of this desire. And this guy was one of them, built this school, crammed as many kids, unqualified teachers, and the result was, and you can see it's a beautiful day in Haiti, there's no rain, there's no earthquake, there's no hurricane, blue sky, white clouds, and literally the building collapsed. So why am I bringing this up? I don't know if you can see it in the next slide. This fellow here, this one here, blue hats, blue caps, they're UN peacekeepers. <coughs> that morning when the word went out that the school collapsed, the UN, which has a peace, still does, and this happened, as I said, in 2008, had a peacekeeping mission in Haiti. The Haitian government had no rescue equipment, no kind of earth mover, bulldozer, plus the street up to the school was so narrow, you couldn't have gotten up there anyway. So UN peacekeepers went up. Brazilian three-star general, who was the force commander of the UN mission, was on his hands and knees with a crowbar trying to lift the concrete up to try to save the kids who were underneath it. So had UN peacekeepers there with picks, shovels, crowbars, whatever it would take. Haitian government, completely absent. People living below where the school was actually had gone to somebody in government and said, don't build that school. It's not in a good place. It's, we're afraid it's gonna fall down on our houses. Nobody listened. And then the sad result, tragically, is the recovering of the bodies. 83 children were killed that day. 83, sitting in a school, it's supposed to be safe and learning. And in their case, it was neither. They weren't learning and it was fatal for those 83. And again, the UN's providing the body bags and recovering as many bodies as they could. So when the earthquake actually did hit 14 months later, you had thousands of buildings like this in Port-au-Prince collapsing. 7.0 earthquake should not kill anybody. If it happened in California or Japan, some windows might crack, a glass might fall off a shelf, nobody's gonna die. In Haiti, a quarter of a million people at least died. We're not really sure, we never know, but at least 250,000 people were killed. A million and a half out on the streets, half a million still, three years later, going on four, living on the streets in tents. What does this say about governance, about accountability, and about the UN. And again, I'm using Haiti as, in a way, not a metaphor, because it actually happened, 
but Haiti as a distillation of these issues, where the state has basically collapsed. One of my Haitian friends says, says Haiti's really a phantom state, not a failed state. There's no oversight, no responsibility, so schools become death traps. A 7.0 earthquake comes along and kills many, many people. And now the UN, peacekeepers as you can see, are involved in many types of activities that no one ever dreamed peacekeepers would be involved with when peacekeeping got started. So I'm going to move on to that in a second, but just to show you the problem persists in Haiti. This is almost my barometer. This is Mon L'Hôpital, which is one of the steep slopes in Port-au-Prince. And you can see, look at those, those are houses, if you want to call them that, and you can see what happened. Some of them in the earthquake slid into this ravine, and the others are basically lucky that they didn't slide, but they certainly easily could. Even a hard rain in Haiti makes houses like that slide down and kills people. And that's the hillside. This is almost my barometer for, for Haiti. When I first started going to Haiti in the late 80s, that was a green, forested mountainside. And each time I go back, I kind of see, OK, how much higher up the hill are they? How much have they grown across? Just judging, there are probably as many people living on what you're seeing as live in Scranton. And there's not a toilet in there. There's not a water pipe. There's not a sewer. There's not a safe electric line in that whole hillside. And that's just one hillside in one part of Port-au-Prince. Back to peacekeeping now. As I said, originally, peacekeeping was very much about military getting in between two fighting forces. In fact, if you look at the UN Charter, you won't even see the word peacekeeping. It was never anticipated. And that's interesting because now it's probably the biggest activity and has the biggest part of the UN budget, certainly, is for peacekeeping. But it's not in the Charter. How did this happen? A little slight history lesson, 1956 Suez Crisis. I know some of you here are old enough to remember that. Suez Crisis, General Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal. Britain, France, Israel kind of went crazy, launched an attack. U.S. is not, what's going on here? Other countries, we, well, we got to get out of this. This is not good. And Lester Pearson, who at that time was the foreign minister of Canada, came up with the idea of peacekeeping. He said, let's put in between the fighting sides, neutral, impartial from other countries, peacekeepers is the word that got coined, with their blue helmets, and they literally would at least buy time and space to hope the fighting subsides and work out some peace agreement. And that's what you had in Suez in 1956, where troops from other countries literally got between the warring parties, enforced a ceasefire, made sure nobody got too close to the line, made sure nobody was shooting across the line or had heavy weapons that were too close, and literally bought time for negotiators to secure a peace. And that's what peacekeeping was starting, started out as, and that was the, really the project. Very much a military exercise with soldiers observing truces and ceasefire lines. Lester Pearson the next year won the Nobel Peace Prize, so even early on people thought this, he was onto something with this idea. So you have Cyprus coming on a few years after that. The peacekeepers are still in Cyprus, not, not these guys, maybe their grand, grandchildren or great grand, but there's still a peacekeeping operation in Cyprus between the Greek and Turkish Cypriots, just trying to keep the peace. And so you, usually you see pictures, and I'll show you a few, they're up in bunk, on watchtowers, bunkers, binoculars, and that's what they're doing. Riding bikes in this case, there's a bike patrol. In the Golan Heights, there are Austrian peacekeepers that actually are a ski patrol. There's actually a lot of snow up there, and the Austrians are used to skiing, and they do their patrols on skis. So that's Cyprus 30 years later, same thing. Again, different peacekeepers, but the same mission. Golan Heights, again, you see something very similar. That very uh, scary looking fence, UN bunker, binoculars, just making sure Syrians aren't getting too close, Israelis on this side, just try to keep everybody calm. Golan Heights, they have their, as I mentioned, ski patrol, and even I'd rather have a sledge dog there too to bring their supplies. So that's peacekeeping traditionally. Basically, from 1956 to the end of the Cold War, 89, 90, 91, that's what peacekeepers did in Sinai. Kashmir between Pakistan and India, 
Cyprus, Golan Heights. Basically, keep the warring parties separate, keep the peace, and then hope there'll be a political solution. Everything changes with the end of the Cold War. And I mean everything when it comes to peacekeeping. Because now, you don't, you don't literally, the Soviet Union's gone. It's gone. And all its satellites are gone, and that frozen Security Council, where each one could veto the other, the US could veto what the Soviets wanted to do, the Soviets would veto what we wanted to do, that's finished. So it enabled the UN to be much more expansive and creative in what it did with regard to conflicts. And all of a sudden, you had an explosion of peacekeeping operations, starting really with Bosnia and even a little earlier, early 90s and all of those conflicts. I'm just going to throw them up here. It's amazing, isn't it? That's just the 90s. And I, that's not all of them. I put up, these are the big ones. So just as you look at that list, I think there are two, well, at least two interesting things really jump out when you look at that list of, of where the UN has set, set up peacekeeping operations in the 90s. I'm wondering if anybody, again, I'll throw it back to you. Anyone have any ideas? What are the two aspects of that list that are very interesting, to say the least, about the conflicts and the nature of the conflicts. A lot of Africa, absolutely. It's mostly Africa, except for Timor and Kosovo at the very end, uh, and Georgia, Abkhazia. So a lot of Africa. And then what about the conflicts themselves? What is it about them? They're civil wars. They're internal conflicts, except for Ethiopia, Eritrea. That's the kind of old-fashioned two-state armies with command and control, generals fighting, ceasefire lines, the UN's getting between them. That's the only one. The rest of them are complete messes. They're internal conflicts with lots of fighters, not a lot of command and control. If militia leader A says to his guys, do this or do that, and they don't want to, they get rid of militia leader A. Very difficult then when you're trying to figure out who do I negotiate with, who do I talk to, what kind of agreement can I get. The other aspect of these kinds of conflicts, which is really terrifying, and probably the biggest challenge for peacekeepers, is that civilians are the, are the victims. Overwhelmingly. In fact, the ratio has been reversed. In traditional wars between states, army against army, the ratio roughly was 90% of the casualties were combatants, soldiers and 10% civilians. It's completely flipped in these conflicts. 90% of the casualties are civilians. Men, women, children, people who aren't fighting. Only about 10% are actually soldiers fighting each other. So civilians are the primary targets, and that's the word I'd use, of the fighters. To either intimidate, force to run away, rape, torture, whatever it is. So the trauma to these societies in these conflicts is extreme and pervasive throughout the country. This has been one of the biggest challenges for UN peacekeepers. It's not like you're in Cyprus where you have the Turks over here and the Greeks over here and they're kind of organized and their militaries certainly are organized. You're in Eastern Congo where there may be 20, 30 fighting groups and each week the alliances change the commanders change, and all of them are trying to get influence, goods, weapons, food, and who do they persecute? Civilians, the population. And again, here's the beginning of this century, just the first 12, 13 years. I should add, next time Mali is up there now, the peacekeeping mission in Mali was just created last August. Right as we're speaking, the Security Council is probably voting a resolution to authorize a peacekeeping mission in the Central African Republic. And who knows, Syria may end up there someday, or Yemen, or both. So, and again, same thing, most are internal. There are a few that are a little more like the traditional ones. Some have obviously regional elements, where they're fighters inside a country and they're getting support from someone outside the country. But these are primarily civil wars, internal conflicts. And again, the main characteristic is it's civilians that are suffering. And government services and protection have completely broken down. 
And that's what you, when you, so when you go into a Liberia or a Sierra Leone and there are no police, there are no courts, nobody except the guys with the guns. So modern peacekeeping, modern peacekeeping looks very, very different from those earlier slides of Cyprus and Golan Heights. Now, two main differences I would say is there's a big focus on how do you protect civilians because they're the victims of these conflicts. And two, it's now much more than a purely military activity. Yes, you see the people in blue helmets and they have their armored personnel carriers, but they're people like me and they're police and they're humanitarian actors and lots of civilians who are now part of peacekeeping operations trying to deal with these deficits where it comes to there's no police. Well, we have to get a police. When I was in Kosovo, right after the NATO bombing, all the police had been Serbs. They ran away because they lost. So you're a place with two billion people and it's not like everyone's now an angel. No, there's still lots of problems. You need a police force, but we don't have any police. So we had to start to create, recruit, train, and deploy a police service for Kosovo. And that takes time. And how do, you, how do you make sure you're picking the right people? And what happens when you don't? How do you get rid of all these questions? This is something peacekeepers never had to do. And now it's routine. Do the same thing in Rwanda, do the same thing in Timor. Police and Haiti, brand new police forces, court systems, all the lawyers in here, many of my cousins. <laughs> Judges are corrupt. Prosecutors don't show up. I visited courtrooms in Haiti. You go in to see the judge. He doesn't have a legal text in sight. Maybe he didn't even graduate from law school. He got the job because his cousin was the friend of this guy and that guy. That's your justice system. And again, I'm using Haiti. It's the same in many other countries. So now UN peacekeepers are asked to try to help restore. And in some places, it's not even restoring because there was not much there to begin with. You're talking about building a judicial system, building a police force that actually protects people and doesn't kill them or extort money from them. And then you're also dealing with the security needs because there's often still some fighting and conflict going on. As I said, that's, again, that's another slide from Congo. I said that civilians are the main victims, not the combatants. This is a big problem. I'm going to stop here for a second because one of the things we see now in almost every modern conflict is the technical term, I use it up there, forgive me, the acronym. You know you're in the UN when you use a lot of acronyms. IDPs, internally displaced persons. What does that mean? That means they would be refugees, except they haven't crossed an international border. To be a refugee legally, you have to cross an international border. There are lots of refugees still, for sure, but we're seeing a huge growth of internally displaced persons. People who can't get out of their country, but they've been forced from their homes because of the fighting, because of threats, because of whatever, food shortages. In Syria, right now, I think the last figure I saw was that there are three to four million internally displaced persons. And there are over two million refugees. Half in Turkey, most of the rest in Lebanon or Jordan. But you have a huge population inside Syria that's not at home, not at their jobs, kids aren't going to school, and they arguably are even more at risk because they're within reach of the people who forced them to leave. So the IDP, and that's from Congo. Congo at one point had the largest IDP population in the world. It was several millions. So again, think about that. Think about if you were told or you felt you had to leave your house with what you can carry. And you have maybe an hour or two to do it. And you don't know when you're coming home and you don't know where you're going. So think of the psychological trauma of that, let alone the physical safety issues. And that's what you see now in many of these conflict, conflicts is the, this tragedy of, of IDPs. And the UN has to deal with it. Who deals with it? It's mostly the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Despite their name, they were supposed to only work with refugees, but people realized you have to help these internally displaced because they are basically the same thing other than not being able to leave their country. And so you'll see camps with systems trying to set up to deliver food, to deliver water, and some modicum of health care. You can't be everywhere, and this is a big challenge for the UN. They do, especially the military, will try by physical presence to provide some protection to all these people. But again, I'll try to put it in terms that I think will be very clear. When I was in Kosovo, 
which is the size of Connecticut, we had 40,000 NATO troops. That's an unbelievable, that's not bad. We had 40,000 highly trained, mobile, skilled NATO troops in a place as big as Connecticut. And we still couldn't protect everybody. We still couldn't, and you'll see uh, a few slides later, we didn't. Congo, by contrast, as big as Western Europe, 19,000 peacekeepers in, with no roads. I mean, Kosovo had pretty good roads even. Congo, horrible roads, horrible telecommunications, horrible everything, and you only have 19,000 troops, and you have a territory as large as Western Europe. So it's impossible for those troops to protect everybody. So they have to be very strategic about where they patrol, where they put their assets, and where they identify where are the most likely areas of violence, and how can we try to prevent it some way or another. So you often see the UN trying to get out of their, certainly out of their bases and, and being out and visible as much as they can. Delivering humanitarian assistance has become a big job in all missions. It's a huge problem, often in many of the African countries because the transportation is so bad. Again, very, very limited road networks, uh, dense forest, very few landing strips, so you have to use helicopters. They're very expensive. They also can be dangerous. I always no mean to, I don't mean to slight anyone, but whenever I get in a UN helicopter and I hear the Russian, I think, oh gosh, <laughs> I hope I'm going to get to where I need to go. Because the UN sometimes goes with the lowest bidder, and guess who the lowest bidder is? It's often Russian helicopter companies, and they've been known to crash. So, <laughs> don't tell my mother I said that. <laughs> okay. Patrolling the cities, again, urban areas. This is where you have not only UN military, but UN police. These are police officers from various countries who are assigned to go to UN peace operations. And here's an example. They are training. This is a female police officer on the right from Portugal who is doing some on-the-job training with uh, one of the new police officers in Timor-Leste, which used to be a Portuguese colony. So there is actually some affinity and language compatibility between Portugal and the Timorese, which is why Portugal had a major role in, in Timor. So training new police, that's something I've done a lot, certainly on human rights issues uh, in the places I've worked. It's a big deal because often human rights have been violated systematically in these countries for decades. Uh, in Kosovo, British, some very highly trained guys have been in Northern Ireland. Now are actually, you know, we had British very skilled British troops actually escorting kindergarten students to their schools. These were Serbian kids who, after things turned and now the Albanians ran everything and the Serbs were being targeted, it was not safe for those kids to walk to school. So UN peacekeepers were literally escorting Serbian kindergarten students to their schools and then back home again in the afternoon. But here they're handing out food and school supplies. There's a British patrol in Pristina. And this slide shows, again, interacting with the population. This is something, again, that's new from the old peacekeeping. The military folks have had to learn how do we interact with the population, what are their needs, language training even sometimes, so they can literally speak the language to the folks. But it's no longer this military to military relationship. This was too late. At one point, there were NATO troops guarding all the main Serb Orthodox churches and monasteries. Uh, but they couldn't guard every one of them. And here some uh, Albanian extremists uh, got some dynamite and exploded and destroyed a, a, an ancient, actually medieval, beautiful, had been beautiful Serbian Orthodox church uh, outside Pristina. So this is again something peacekeepers now have to do. Cultural sites, religious sites often have to be guarded and try to be protected. Back to Haiti, helping people vote. This is a big deal, and a lot of these countries, for the first time, are going to have what they hope will be free and fair elections. Uh, so getting people to the polls, monitoring the polls, making sure there isn't any cheating, as we've known to happen in some places in even our country, uh, certainly can happen in other countries, so how do you try to control that? And here's another one that's very important in Burundi, and not only Burundi, but I just took this as an example, what the UN calls DDR, disarmament, demobilization and reintegration. The R is the tricky part. 
It's actually not that difficult. It can be to get the weapons from the fighters, to demobilize them. The big challenge is now what do you do with them? And again, in a place like Burundi, I can tell you the unemployment rate is probably 70%, 7 0. So, what are these guys going to do? And they've been used to being the big, big, big guy in town. I've got a gun, I get what I want because I have a gun. Now I'm unemployed, no prospects. What do I do? First of all, we've seen a huge spike in domestic violence after fighters return home. A lot of them take it out on spouses or partners, whatever. And a big uptick in crime, because this is what they know how to do. So one of the big challenges is the reintegration part. How do you take these thousands of fighters that this is all they've done. Some of them since childhood, the child soldiers, have grown up in the bush fighting. Now they're 19, 20, 21, 22. What future do they have? A huge challenge. Here the World Bank and other international financial agencies have got to do much more in trying to spur the economy so that there are some jobs for people. And in Sudan, you sit under a tree, sometimes for hours, drinking endless cups of tea, which are heavily sugared, which maybe helps keep you going, um, talking about peace, about the future with the elders. Again, I've seen soldiers, people like me, and others in the peacekeeping do this all the time. And then I'm going to end with a, just a couple of slides back in Haiti. Back in 2006, there was a time where there were gangs in, in the slums of Haiti. The most important slum is Cité Soleil, where that whole slum was off limits to UN peacekeepers. There was so much violence. These gangs had such control that UN, with a Chapter 7, which is the strongest mandate the Security Council can give, armed soldiers were not going in because it was too dangerous. And eventually, what happened was there was a kidnapping of a whole busload of kids outside Cité Soleil. A whole busload of kids one afternoon was kidnapped by one of these gangs for ransom. And at that point, the president of Haiti said, I tried negotiating with these guys. He thought he could with the gang leaders. And he went to the head of the UN peacekeeping mission and said, do what you need to do. Negotiations aren't working. And back to our Brazilian three-star general, Brazilian peacekeepers had responsibility for Port-au-Prince. They developed, through a lot of good intelligence, a plan to go in and try to, and I'll use the word carefully, eliminate the gang leaders. It could be arrest, it could be something else. They got really good intelligence. They found out where the gang leaders' safe houses were, where they stored the weapons, where the lookouts were that would warn when somebody's coming. They had it all figured out. Some of them had done this kind of work in the favelas in, in Rio de Janeiro. There was also actually a Spanish military officer who had worked against the ETA, the, the Basque terrorists, who basically said, these guys, this is child's play next to ETA. I mean, those guys, these, these guys are easy to infiltrate. And eventually, the Brazilians led an operation. Again, very unusual for the UN to take the offensive. They usually will wait. But in this case, they went after the gang leaders. And I'm glad to say they were able to capture most of them. They killed a few who resisted. And the gang problem was eliminated in Cité Soleil. Again, this is not what peacekeeping started out as. That's, that's my, my main point. And here you see them in action in, in Cité Soleil. And there I am a, a little bit afterwards <laughs> talking to one of them and asking him about more details of the operation. And it really was a success. I mean, I didn't get a picture. I wish I had of a woman who came up to us as we're talking, an old uh, Haitian woman who said in, in Creole, which is almost the same as French, Messi, Messi. They were thrilled. The population was thrilled to have these gangs off their backs because the gangs were extorting money from them. The water pump, one example. The gangs controlled the water pump. Again, people don't have running water in this slum. If you want water, you go to the pump with your bucket. There's a guy from the gang saying, you want to get to the pump? It's three gourd, five gourd, whatever it is. And so you had to pay to get the water. And the money went to the gang, to the leader, for weapons, for drugs, whatever. So the population was thrilled that finally the gangs were gone. So that's all I want to say for the moment. I hope you'll have some questions and comments. But I hope it's clear that we really have come quite a distance from those early days of peacekeeping. 
And now this is very typical for UN peacekeeping operations to have what they call multifaceted approaches, military, police, humanitarian, legal, elections. Everybody's out there doing all these hope, good things. One of the challenges is how does the UN coordinate itself? How do you make sure you're not getting in each other's way? Uh, and that's been a challenge. I have to say, I think there's been a lot of improvement. When I first started doing this work, hard to believe, 20 years ago in Haiti in 1993, we made a lot of mistakes. I think over the years, 20 years now, we've learned a lot of lessons. And at least I think there's now much better communication within certainly the UN peacekeeping missions about who's doing what, how can you partner, how do you hand off something to somebody else to make sure you're either not duplicating or you're not letting something slip through the cracks. So. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention. I really do welcome any questions or comments you have in the time we have left. Okay, I'll just start back there as I see them. How many peacekeepers are employed right now? Good question. Military, I, I couldn't give you an overall figure. Military, I'm guessing about 70,000. 7 zero, 70 or 80,000, and it changes. Police are probably 20,000, and civilians, at least that, I'm talking international now, uh, for civilians, probably 20 to 30,000. So quite a few. And the peacekeeping budget, as I said, is, one of, is probably the largest part of the UN. Peacekeeping budget is part of the largest overall budget. But I have to say, people have done comparisons. It is so much cheaper than a military intervention. I mean, the UN peacekeeping budget probably is not, annual, is probably not even one month of Iraq. Yes, ma'am. Can you say something about uh, women peacekeeping? Good question. This is, uh-huh. Where'd she go? I went past her. <laughs> Earlier, <laughs> there she is. Let me break it down again. On the military side of it, it's not good because most militaries are still predominantly male. You see some improvements as the troop contributing countries, what TCCs as they're called in UN speak, have more and more women. On the police, it's better. And here you see an example, this Portuguese police officer. I remember when I was in Liberia, it was amazing. There was a brigade of Indian female police who arrived all at once a brigade, and they came out of their, the flight and on the airport, and they're led by this woman, and they're in their kit, and they're doing their drill, and the Liberians, men and women, mouths were dropping. They'd never seen anything like this. It was fantastic. But still, there's a long way to go. On the civilian side, it's much better. It's probably close to 50-50 in the other areas I'm talking about, human rights, rule of law, elections, that kind of thing. But in the uniform part, it's somewhat a reflection of the country's own composition of forces, their military or police. But the UN realizes it's got a pretty big job to do because they're preaching gender equality, gender equality, and it's physician heal thyself kind of. Well, look at, look, what are you sending us? You're sending us 90% male soldiers and only 10%, I'm making that up. I think that's probably, that's probably right though. But the attitude towards them, I'd say is quite good in my experience. Uh, they're taken very seriously, and there are now, again, in UN speak, SRSGs. Those are special representatives of the Secretary General. Those are the top, that's the top person in the UN peacekeeping mission. That used to be very bad. There used to be almost all men. And now I think they're at least, it's still not what it should be, but I think they're, last count, four or five women out of, don't quote men this, but let's say 15 peacekeeping missions are now women. So again, it's not what it should be. So it's maybe 20, 25% women, but it's a lot better than it used to be. Um, maybe this is a silly question, but what is everyone fighting about? What are most people fighting about? No, it's a very good question. Um, if we really knew the answer completely, <laughs> we might get somewhere. Um, a lot of it's back to power. It's human nature. People want power. And they see things in a zero-sum game. This is what I really come to understand, I think. The tradition of compromise, I mean, even in Washington that seems to be lost, but the tradition of compromise, of negotiating, it's if you win, I lose. 
and that's how they see it. And then there's the, can be, it depends on the place, ethnic, religious dimension. My people, you're not part of my people. There's a great quote from the Balkans when Yugoslavia was breaking up. I think it was the president, the first president of Macedonia said, why should I be a minority in your country when you could be a minority in my country? And, and there's a lot to that too. So, but I think it's a lot, it's power. In really powerless people. Yeah. When you started out, you were talking about the skepticism and the feeling that uh, people don't care. And I, you know, listening to you, I thought there's so much of this that we don't know as the general mm. public that we don't hear. Do you feel like the UN really gets out there enough and lets people know what they're no. doing so there would be more support? No, I think they do a very bad job at this, at their own kind of Self-promotion maybe is too hard, but just getting the message out, they're really bad. Um, and they have to figure out how to do better, and they're still very old-fashioned. I was at a meeting a few weeks ago on Syria where, with senior UN people, and they were saying, how, we got to use Facebook. How do we use social? How do we get into this? They don't know. The Department of Public Information is still working as though it's 1980. So I think they have to go do a much better job about this in every way. Because there are, there are some good things happening, but you just, you know. Yes? I don't know if you're aware of a woman from this area story. She lives in Naples, Florida, so she started a foundation called Naples Women's Foundation. And she's been working with a lot of people for Haiti. And um, they do a lot of really, I know, you know, this mm -hmm. is a different subject, but they do a lot of good work. And um, really have raised a lot of money for mm -hmm. Haiti. And, you know, I just wanted to. That's good. I'm not aware of that. But that, but that you raise a good point because there's a whole world of what we call NGOs, non-governmental organizations, and how the peacekeepers work with them. It's very important. And Haiti's a case study. Because I was in Haiti right after the earthquake, helping, because the UN, it was the biggest catastrophe in UN history. It lost 102 people. 110, 102 UN people were killed because their headquarters collapsed. Uh, I had a lot of friends who were, who were killed. And so I was asked to go down and literally help the mission back up on its feet. And the first morning I went out for a meeting and I saw this sea, literally a sea of vehicles. There had to be 100 NGO representatives, which is great. But then how do you, it's like herding cats, someone said about this. How do you get folks so that we don't have 10 water projects over here and none over there? And so it's great stuff. And I don't mean to be criticizing them at all. They're a hugely important partner. But it's a challenge to how to, because the UN has no authority over them, and it shouldn't. But they're also doing some, somewhat similar things. And how, do, how does the UN and how does everybody do a better job of making sure the resources are maximized and not wasted? But I, I'm not aware of that organization, but there are lots of them, and that, that's good to hear. Yes? Oh. From the right. And the second, the totally different question is, what is the situation of the United States and their funding portion to the UN? Okay. The first one, I get so upset, but I'm glad you asked it. This is back to your point. This is where the UN's public information office was disgraceful. And I've told them this. The way they handled that cholera outbreak was absolutely so offensive and condescending and wrong. I think they've realized it, but they still... So, you get, I think you see how I feel about how they've <laughs> handled it. And as one of my Haitian friends said, unless, unless extraterrestrials landed in Haiti, it was the troops from Nepal who brought the cholera. I mean, it's, and Yale... Public School of Public Health has done a study, epidemiological study, that absolutely shows that this strain of cholera never existed in Haiti and is quite common in Nepal. And the soldiers had just been to, uh, they had been deployed in a part of Nepal where there was this cholera. So they come to Haiti, they put their camp up, their sanitation system isn't what it should be, leaks into the river, and this is now I blame Haiti, why are Haitians still having to go to a river to get their water, but they do, they get their water, and the cholera spreads. And you have, I don't know how many people dead. And the UN says, why should, we don't want to get, why should we care about how it got here? Let's do what we can to help. And I mean, the Haitians understandably, no, we want to know how did it get here? And you know, what was your role? 
Now here's the legal, I mean the legal problem is the UN has immunity and I think it's pretty tight. And a, a guy I know who's based with a public interest firm in Boston has brought a lawsuit in New York federal court against the UN, but I think it's pretty symbolic. I don't think it has a chance at all because the UN, and to, not that I'm, they, as I said, they handle this really badly, but I do understand they can't open themselves up to lawsuits. I mean, they would just spend all their time doing that. So immunity is very important, and that's partly why they've taken this strong line, but it's really foolish, I think, because they haven't, I don't think they need, they could still keep their immunity and behave a lot better. That's my point. One way they could behave better, and here it's in, you can look in the status of forces agreement. Every time the UN sends a peacekeeping mission to anywhere, they will enter what's called a status of forces agreement with the host country, which basically is a contract saying, here's what we'll do. And they have what's called a complaints commission in the status of forces agreement. Yes, to say, we will create a commission to handle any complaints about the UN and its relations with the host country. This can go from the UN crashes into somebody's car to something much more serious like this. They have never set up this commission. So what the folks at Yale are doing after they've done this study is they're trying now to get some pressure going, put some pressure on the Secretary General in his office to build, to create this commission that, that then could start to process claims and people could show, yes, my uncle died of cholera. It's the cholera that was near the Nepal camp. And what, what can we do about this? Just as you would do here, a wrongful death, some of the, the analogy here would be a wrongful death action. But the UN so far is resisting even that. And I think they have a huge crisis on their hands because even my Haitian friends that believe in the UN, that thinks the mission is doing mostly good work, is really angry about this. And they're losing a lot of support. So I think this has been a, an avoidable disaster uh, for the UN in terms of how it handled what it created, and it could be doing much more. Now they say, we're sending all this money, we're going to invest in water purification, and the UN Development Program is going to do this, going to do that. That's all fine, but it's, it's not, not sufficient. On the UN, US, uh, the uh, sometimes recurring issue of our payment of our UN dues, I, you know, I don't quote me. I believe we're okay. I think we're up to where we're supposed to be. Yeah, I, I double check that, but I think the reason I'm saying is we would hear about it if it weren't. Um, and I haven't heard anything. So I think we're, and to be fair to us and you, we're all the taxpayers, we're the largest contributor to the UN budget. I think it was at 27%. It may have gone down to 26 or 25. Um, so the U.S. is the largest contributor to the United Nations, as it should be. We're the largest economy in the world, still by quite a bit. So, but as far as I know, I think we're okay. We're not in arrears anyway, which we were for a certain times so under the Bush administration. We were often, and yeah. Uh, yes. You've been describing these peacekeeping missions, and it seems like once peacekeeping missions are going in, it's very hard to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. You raise a good point because there are two. I'm going to just flag. Haiti and Timor were second tries. There had been earlier missions in Haiti. The first peace mission I ever was involved with was in 1993 in Haiti. It lasted till 2001. And then everybody left. And then 2004 place exploded, Aristides chased out again, new mission. Similarly, in East Timor, there was a mission from roughly 1999 to 2003, more or less. Everybody said, job done, we can go home, they go home. And then three years later, literally the Timorese army and police were shooting at each other in Dili. <laughs> Back in. So two, at least two very important points from your question. One, how do you know when you can leave? What are your, as they say, measures or indicators or uh, the other terms that the management consultants use, which are important? Because if you leave too soon, 
I can tell you, having been involved with both phases of Haiti, it's much harder the second time. <laughs> it's much harder. Um, so how do you avoid both staying too long, which I think is the case with Kosovo, or leaving too soon? So where is that sweet spot? I don't think we've gotten there yet. I think we have better indicators, but nothing's foolproof. The second part of your question, which is very important, is the sustainability part. And this is something that I'm always aware of. In fact, when, when I was in Haiti, I didn't make myself very popular with my staff because I said, we're here to work ourselves out of a job. <laughs> we are here to make ourselves obsolete so that they don't need us anymore. That's our goal. Some people kind of liked <laughs> being in the job and staying in Haiti or wherever. But I said, our job is to get, make it so that the locals who know the country much better than we ever will, are, are they're okay. They'll be able to do it. So I think, again, this is something else the UN has gotten a bit better. The, the term they use is sustainability. So how is the program we're designing? First of all, should we be designing it? It should be the locals designing it with our help. It should be the locals who implement it with our help. And this is something I think your NGOs, um, I, they're much better at this. These NGOs, I believe most of them, not all of them, are much better at working with the local counterparts and what they call building capacity. So how do we design programs that won't collapse when we all leave? That's the nightmare. So again, example from Haiti, USAID comes in with this consulting firm, Beltway Bandits they're called. Again, I'm kind of giving my feelings away. <laughs> they come in with this beautiful program for case management. Ah, we've seen the Haitian courts. I said, you're right, they have a problem with case management. I've gone into Haitian judges' offices, you know where their case filing is? It's a hook, a hanger, shaped as a hook with the papers jammed on the hook. That's their filing system. So the USAID guys say, we're going to change this, we're going to put in computers. <laughs> and we have this program, we tried it out in St. Louis, it works beautifully. <laughs> And I said, that's very nice, but do you realize this courtroom has no electricity? <laughs> <laughs> and the judge's door doesn't really lock. So how long do you think that computer is going to last here? So these are the, I mean, I'm taking an extreme case, but believe me, that's not unique. That is not unique. So how do you start to say, okay, what kind of case management system? Because they do need one, absolutely. But what's going to be workable here? What can they sustain? What can they afford? I mean, this police issue is a big problem. When you go, when you're looking at the budgets, the police are expensive. Salaries, cars, communications. And the Timor police, the Haiti police, right now, their budget is probably 60 to 70 percent dependent on foreign assistance, not on the Haitian tax base. That's not sustainable. So it's a multi, again, the multifaceted problem is how do you design programs so that police can, the police have to be able to move, they have to be able to talk to each other, they need to be paid. We've seen what happens when they don't get paid. Oof, that's corruption. I think Haiti, I just saw the Transparency International Index for corrupt countries. Haiti's like 167 out of 178. So you've got to make sure your people are paid or else they're going to be looking for bribes everywhere they turn around. But then how do you get the tax base up to the point where it can support? And again, I'll use Haiti as an example. The rich people on the top of the hill are not paying any taxes. It's all in bank accounts in Miami or Montreal or Paris. I have this Haitian guy, I know, rich guy, I thought he was enlightened. There's a huge pothole in front of his mansion. You go inside his mansion, there's a tennis court, satellite TVs, three Mercedes. And I said, look at that hole. He said, don't you think it would be good if you paid some taxes and the streets would come and fill in the hole? <laughs> he looked at me like, well, where are you from? I'll just get a bigger car. I'm not going to pay these guys taxes. Now, part of that is he's right because they're corrupt. The odds of that money going to fill the hole are not that high. <laughs> but it's also his approach is, it's for, again, back to it's me. I want, it's my money, I'm not giving it to them. So there's a real problem, and again, in many of these countries, in getting folks to pay their fair share when you've had, a, unfortunately, a history of corruption 
and no service delivery anyway. And there hasn't been an experience of, yeah, the police actually come and do their job, the courts actually open and stay open all day, the schools are safe, all the things I started out saying, hasn't been their experience. How do you turn that around? Boy, that's a, after decades, that's not easy. The, the mentality shift, huge. I'll work my way around and then come back if there's time, yes? Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. The humanitarian access issue in Syria is enormous, an enormous problem, mostly because of the Syrian government. It's not letting assistance get to where it needs to go, which is mostly in the opposition-controlled territories. That's a clear violation of the laws of war. Um, they're not letting anything come in from Turkey because that part of Syria is controlled by the opposition still. I've talked to the High Commissioner of Human Rights representative in New York. He described for me what it took to get the first convoy they got through in February. It took days of negotiations with the Syrian government, and in a space of about 20 miles, they had 19 checkpoints. And it took them eight hours to go 19 or 20 miles. And they've, I think, gotten in nine convoys since February. Clearly not enough. So it's a huge problem. And you're right, when I was talking about the IDPs, the uh, situation in, I keep going the wrong way on this. <laughs> the situation in Turkey is, I mean, the situation in Syria is, is horrendous. I think, you, you may be right, I think they may have the largest IDP population in the world now. And they can't be reached. There was a story on the BBC last night about famine in some of the towns right around Damascus, right around the capital, because the government won't let food get in, and then you're saying, well, why aren't people leaving? Well, this brings back very bad images of Bosnia and Srebrenica, because some, when people did leave those villages early, the, every man or boy over the age of 14 was taken away, separated as a potential or actual fighter and they've never seen them again. So the people remaining in the town, they're not gonna take the chance. And remember in Srebrenica, they took all the Muslim men and boys and killed them, 7,000. Clear act of genocide in Bosnia in 1995. So, but that is really, and then we hear a lot about the opposition and their jihadists and there's some that, and I'm sure that's true and they're doing some nasty things, but overwhelmingly, it's the Syrian government, Bashar's government, that's responsible for this particular aspect of the crisis, is IDPs and lack of humanitarian access, which is a war crime under the Geneva Conventions. I'll get both. Yes, sorry. Yes, go ahead. Well, well as, as the work of the peacekeepers seems to be increasing, 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 mm -hmm. how, is, how is the funding picture in general? It's not good. It's never enough. Um, the UN is constantly kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul. Uh, in fact, they've already done this with Mali. They've taken troop carriers and troops even from Cote d'Ivoire to Mali, because they think Mali, uh, Cote d'Ivoire is more or less okay, and they may be right, I hope they are. They're talking about doing the same thing in Central African Republic, taking some troops from Sudan and South Sudan. But um, they need more. But that's where you get back to your question about the US and budgets and who's gonna go for putting in more money when there's still a fairly significant financial crisis in many of the main countries that contribute, such as the US, Western Europe. So there's not a lot of, and this is where the UN needs to do a better job, I think, in creating support for perhaps increasing the budget. But people back home are saying, wait a minute, we don't have enough for our own schools, hospitals, whatever, and they're right. So that's a, that's a kind of tough spot the UN is in. makes up the UN uh, peacekeeping force, how are they trained, and I suppose to that, this pretty complicated work, how good are they? Are That's a good question. Are these mercenaries? No, no, they're not mercenaries, no, no, not mercenaries. Um, but you raise a good point. The main troop contributing countries right now, it's interesting when you look at them, they're India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and did I say Pakistan? Yeah, yeah Pakistan and um, 
what's the fifth one? Nigeria. Nigeria. Yeah. They, they contribute the most number of troops for peacekeeping. Their quality varies. I have worked with fantastic soldiers from all those countries. I've worked with less fantastic. Their training also depends a lot. Some are very well trained and their staff colleges at home, certainly the general officers, lower ranking troops, that is a bit, bit varying too. Um, now, they're not mercenaries, but you raise an interesting point. Why those countries? A couple of reasons. One is they have pretty large armies and fairly well equipped and reasonably trained and now experienced. I've never gone to, an, when I was in Nepal, every military officer I went to above the rank of, of colonel, the first, if I was lucky, 10 minutes, if I was unlucky, 30 minutes of the meeting was their peacekeeping experience. And they had the plaques and the coffee mugs and I was in Cyprus and I did the answer, fine. So, there's, but, so there is experience, but there's money. The money comes in, the UN gives them a certain amount of money per soldier to cover their costs, but it more than covers their costs. And guess what? Do you think the soldier gets all that extra money? No. <laughs> it's the people back in their versions of the Pentagon, the Ministry of Defense. So let's say the soldier gets $20 a day, I'm just making this up, and the UN gives $40 a day. And so the soldier gets his 20, the other 20 goes right, and multiply that several thousand times, it it's gets to be serious money. So for some of these troop military countries, there's also a financial, it helps their military budget, literally. The flip side of this is notice who I have said is not tr contributing troops. Us, Europe, pretty much writ large, and that's a problem, big problem, because we are now authorizing these kinds of missions with all kinds of challenges and danger, peacekeepers get killed. And who authorizes at the Security Council? The countries that don't send troops. <laughs> so this, and the troop contributing countries, understandably, are saying, what about you guys? So this is an issue. Now, there might be a little bit of a breakthrough. The Dutch are actually sending 500 troops to Mali First time since Bosnia, which was technically a NATO operation, wasn't technically UN peacekeeping, but it you know, looked a lot like it. But, and they, had their, they were involved in Srebrenica. I mean, the Dutch soldiers were there and didn't stop the Serbs from taking the, the Muslims away and killing them. Trauma, the government fell in Holland over it. All kinds of trauma at home. And now, though, and it's no accident, the special representative of the Secretary General in Mali is Dutch. So he's working his connection, he's a politician, he's working his connections back at home, and the Dutch are sending 500 troops to Mali, which is great. I'm hoping that this may lead to more participation by Europe. There's talk here that now as we wind down in Iraq and Afghanistan, we're gonna have a lot of soldiers that are used to being out in difficult situations, might, might, underscore it 23 times, the U.S. now consider going back into UN peacekeeping because we used to. So this is, yeah, but thanks for the question. Similar, uh, similar question. How much of UN's peacekeeping resources are standing resources? How much are ad hoc? That's a very good. Are they contracts? Very good question. The core budget is what the UN calls its, its annual budgetary process. It's, it's not extra budgetary. So they, each year, the ACABQ, which I can't think if I can remember what it stands for, it's a budget committee, something something budget committee, um, comes up with the budget. So peacekeeping is funded out of that. So this, all you see, these guys in their kit and their vehicles, that's funded out of the regular budget. But there are some issues, for example, a lot of the human rights projects or development projects have to come extra budgetary. Now some of those might come from, let's say, the UNDP budget. Others, it's voluntary contributions from member states. I hope that answers, that's not too confusing or? Um, in, in terms of numbers of people. People. You talked about, I think, about 150, 160,000. If you add everybody up, yeah, yeah. 
Are most of those non employees? No, those, those are on the budget. Those would be regular budget. The program, some of them might want to implement, you might have to find the money somewhere else. But their salaries, their, their office space, that would all be part of the budget. And the, and the, and those, but the military contingents are contract from member states. No. The, the, well, the UN contracts with the member state. So the UN will say, Pakistan, you're sending 5,000 troops to Haiti, great. Here's the money, X, that we owe you for sending those troops. And that comes from the budget, that money. And I assume the UN has no military of its own? No. The member states, the US, the Russians would never let that happen. Somebody said the Secretary General is more secretary than general. There's no military. It was talked about early on, but the, the member states said there's no way we're going to let the UN have its own army. That's why you have this, yeah. The then yeah. that guess. Isn't the, the uh, Security Council that makes the major decisions on these uh, operations? You're right. And that means it's five, the permanent five. And do they go along? Do they agree? They... It depends. <laughs> they argue, they negotiate. Um, the Russians kept saying about Haiti, why are we keeping why is Haiti? Why are we keep doing Haiti? And the US said, well, it's in a. And then when the U.S. says, well, what about Georgia? And the Russians say, not on your life. No way. That's our backyard. So, but the key, you're right to raise it. It's the Security Council, but it's the five permanent members that have a veto. And you've got to have all of them on board, because it just takes one to stop it. And that's what happened in the Cold War. That's what I meant earlier. During the Cold War, with the Soviet Union and the U.S., things got blocked, because they automatically were going to veto each other. It opened up a lot after the end of the Cold War. It's closing now because Russia's behaving more like the old Soviet Union. You see that with Syria. We've had three double vetoes on Syria. That's very rare. China and Russia exercised their veto when it came to resolutions regarding Syria. Yes, Maury, and then I'll come back, sure. You know, Bill, I've been an admirer of you for years. And I'm here today, 80, Darfur, Mali, my question is, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> what, under what auspices? And where do you go? And how do you decide when to go? I'm not sure who I am still, but uh, <laughs> um, I sometimes decide myself. Sometimes I, I don't work for the UN. I should have said that earlier on. I'm not a UN employee. I am occasionally asked by the UN to join a peacekeeping mission, and I've done that. I am now. I run a program at something called the Social Science Research Council, based in Brooklyn. And we have the UN as our main client. So I'm actually interacting a lot with the UN because the UN comes to us when they want more analysis and information about the places I've been talking about. So I hope that answers your question. And maybe the last one, and then we'll, sorry. <laughs> Military, it is done military to military. The UN says we need a battalion, a brigade, or whatever, maybe in engineering, maybe health, maybe combat. And then, they, then the head of peacekeeping has to run around and see which country, it's usually from one of those five that I mentioned, sends them. So that's direct. Police, it's somewhat like that, although the police tend to come as individuals. But they'll work through. Many countries have national police, not like us. So you go to France, Gendarmerie, you go to Italy, Carabinieri, you know, there's one, as Kissinger said, there's a phone number there. I call the police in Italy, somebody answers, they'll come up with people. People like me, it's much more fluid. And there is an application, there's a whole website, I think it's called Galaxy, and people get on and see, oh, I need a human rights officer in Congo, has to speak French, whatever, and people look, see, and then they, they apply. Now, it's been going on long enough that some people are known and the challenge now is to keep the good ones and have the bad ones kind of try to find something else to do and make sure they don't resurface in another mission. But um, the UN's getting better at that. So basically, that's how it works. Sure. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Bill. And I just to say, uh, Bill promised to come if we could get him out on time, because you won't be surprised to learn he's on his way to JFK Airport. <laughs> but I guess maybe he can stay a few more minutes. Um, I wanted to uh, say we do have one more program some of you have signed up for. It's on Monday at 5.30. It's a, um, well, we're on the subject that we're on today. It's about terrorism. Uh, it's a, a roundtable discussion that is um, co-moderated by Julie uh, Cohen, uh, who I think just left, and me. And we have an outstanding um, expert on the subject who's coming to us from Washington, another Scranton native, Michael Greenberger, who heads the Center for um, Homeland Security at the University of Maryland. So there are a few seats left at the table. There, we just have room for about 30. And um, see um, Emily if you think you might be able to go. So this is that will finish this semester, and we are having we have our brochure at the uh, graphic designer on its way to go to the printer. But I'll try to g I'll give you a few highlights. Uh, bear in mind that I like surprising people, so this is a tough exercise for me, and I only give you a few hints. But anyway, we do have a brochure with a brand new look. Stay tuned for that. We have new sponsorship for the World Affairs Luncheons, and it's a distinguished law firm of Munley Law here in Scranton. We're very pleased that in 2014 they'll be sponsoring these uh, luncheons, and there will be 12. Uh, courses next semester. Look for another film course with David Wenzel. It's going to be a, on a film about World War, films about World War I. We have Professor Joseph Krauss uh, from the English department doing Jewish American short stories. And uh, Matt Meyer uh, from our philosophy department is going to be talking about enlightened self-interest. You might call it the American way and if it's working and how it's working now. We are going to Brooklyn. We're having a bus trip to Brooklyn. And uh, we have, um, OK, don't give us your address, and we'll be there. Anyway, a number of collaborative programs. Launch and Seer, we have several about Europe, several Europe, uh, European stories, one from Prague, one from Paris, and one from Palermo. But they're not all European. And that's all I'll tell you. <laughs> Thank you. Come back. <laughs>